Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, talk, which is part of the series of uh, Connection Rio Campinas, a partnership between the Institute of Computing, University of Campinas, <clears throat> Sao Paulo, Brazil, and the Pontificial Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, Puki Rio. Today, we have the pleasure <clears throat> to count with Professor Ricardo Baeza Yates, who will talk to us about ethics in artificial intelligence, a challenging task. This talk is also organized by the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory here, Ricard AI, at the Institute of Computing, University of Computers. Professor Ricardo is Director of Research at the Institute of Experiential AI uh, of Northeastern University. He's also part-time professor at Universidad Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona and Universidad de Chile in Santiago. Before, he was Vice President of Research at Yahoo Labs, based in Barcelona, Spain, and later on, in Sunny Valley, California from 2006 to 2016. He is co-author and uh, of the bestseller Modern Information Retrieval textbook, which I'm sure many of you have seen or studied uh, during college at some point. With this book, Professor Ricardo uh, got uh, the Assist 2012 Book of the Year Award. From 2002 to 2004, he was elected to the Board of Governors of uh, the IEEE Computer Society. And between 2012 and 2016, he was elected for the ACM Council. Since 2010, he is a founding member of the Chilean Academy of Engineering. And in 2009, he was named ACM Fellow and in 11 IEEE Fellow, among many other awards and distinctions. His main areas of expertise include web search and data mining, information retrieval, uh, bias on artificial intelligence, data science, and algorithms in general. So Professor Ricardo, thank you very much for being uh, here today with us and for accepting the invitation to talk to us. So I will stop sharing my screen and the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. It's new institute by Northeastern, the Institute for Experiential AI. Um, that uh, basically tries to uh, give a pragmatic approach to successful AI. Uh, you may not know, but North System started the, the co-op uh, program uh, early in the, ninth, in the 20th century uh, in Boston, uh, something that Waterloo also copied later in, in Canada. And we think that we need to have humans involved and not only humans in the loop, but more than that, and we'll talk about that later, but also don't have this strong dependency on data uh, and have better algorithms, especially when you have uh, small data. So this is what we're doing and you can check the website ai.system.edu on, on, on this new institute uh, led by Usama Fayyad, which is the one that uh, also created Yahoo Labs so it's the second time I'm working with him as a well-known data mining researcher. So the agenda will have two, basically three parts. In the first part, I will mention what, what for me are the five main problems with AI today. And this has a personal bias. Uh, bias is the first problem, so you need to be always conscious on, on, on the bias that you have. And the second part, I will talk about uh, some generic issues that are related to these problems. And then I would like to mention what we can do to partially mitigate all these problems. So let's start with, with the, the first problem, which I call the course of bias. Basically, you have bias data uh, coming to an algorithm. Uh, let me remember that information is biased in some because uh, if you have white noise, you can't do anything. Also, the first bias we have here is that. When we hear the word bias, we think in something negative, but bias is not necessarily negative, it could be positive. So in, in general, it's neutral, it's just a systematic deviation to a reference value. One problem that sometimes we have is that we don't know the bias, and even when we know it, we don't know the reference value. For example, what should be the right proportion of women in every, uh, for example, in every kind of work? This is something that sometimes and needs a cultural consensus, and it's not something that the computer scientists will decide. So this is the situation, and then a natural question to ask is the argument should be neutral or fair. Uh, but normally we don't ask this question very often, and we get the same bias. In Even worse, sometimes we get amplified bias. And if that's the case, 
we cannot say that um, is the problem of the data. Indeed, in most cases, bias comes in the data, but bias is not only in the data. And, and, and if you want to read more about this, you can check my bias on the web paper on publication of ACM, June 2018, where I go to the overall vicious cycle of bias in software systems in the web that are, can be applied to any software system uh, in, the, in the world. So what means to be fair? So that's not easy. So that's a, 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 that uh, it's complicated. So here is a cartoon that explains the difference between equality, equity, justice. Um, justice takes a long time. So usually we, we cannot ask for justice and we, we basically satisfy ourselves with equity and there here you have affirmative actions. So affirmative actions try to change uh, some discrimination like Iceland that now has a law that, that forces companies to give the same salary for the same work to, to women and men. So if you're interested in this topic, I, I strongly recommend this documentary done by mainly uh, black women in the US, Coded Bias. Uh, it's in Netflix and it's translated to, to Portuguese. Uh, much better than the... Um, social dilemma of last year, mainly done by white men. And we had a very interesting debate about this uh, documentary in March in the ACM, where uh, I was representing half of the population, I had that honor, and uh, we had a federal judge, a former president of ACM, and two uh, very well known on on privacy and fairness. That's available in YouTube if you want to hear the discussion. Well, so what is the answer to this question? Well, the question is that uh, as all the complicated problems, the answer depends. Not always you need to worry about these questions. However, and I will get back to this in all my talk, if you harm people in any way, you need to answer this question. You need to take care of this question. Now, how you solve that, that will be a completely different uh, talk, but you can always divide, try to mitigate the input. People talk about the biasing, but you cannot fully the bias a data set because you don't know all the biases that are in there. Uh, that would be the best way, but as I said, we do not know all of them, and also we don't know many different values that we need to use. The second possibility is that the algorithm is about the bias, and you can tune the algorithm. For example, that happens in learning to rank with uh, ranking bias, because people click more on the top positions on search engines, uh, you have to basically de-bias that to, to avoid fooling yourself, thinking that the best positions are the best. And finally, you can always de-bias the output, but then you already lost a lot of information. For example, you search on LinkedIn and you get 40 men and women, you cannot do gender parity. The best you can do is gender parity in the top 20. So the first time that discrimination, uh, I guess, reached the headlines was in 2016, when uh, ProPublica uh, basically uh, reported that a system used for uh, recidivism, recidivism, difficult word in English, uh, Compass had a racial bias. Many people have analyzed this problem later, uh, and, and even people some claim that this is not. In general, this is the case. And, and then here we have the first fundamental question of this type of arguments that are being used by the, by the government. So is this algorithm ethical? Uh, and the question is, we want more transparency. We want to be able to understand what the, what the government is doing. Now, we say ethical, but algorithms cannot be ethical. They are not humans, uh, but let's uh, use uh, this metaphor. And then we need to ask a second question, is, is a public algorithm safe? Because if I know exactly how the algorithm is coded, then maybe I can game it and can manipulate the answer, and then I can fool the system. The, the, the right answer should be between, and, and no one has a, a fixed answer because that depends on the context of where we're solving the problem. Uh, other systems like, for uh, example, uh, Godam, that is from Palantir, uh, are being used for filing. Basically, like my original report, uh, predicting if you will be a criminal before you do something. And this has been mainly uh, use it in secret in the US police in some big cities, but also have been used in some European countries. 
The problem is not when it works, the problem is when it fails, and then you make one error that changes the life of a person. Uh, another example is Fred Paul in the Chicago uh, metropolitan area. And here, uh, just I want to show you the problem of measuring that is also biased, because if police goes to certain places, you will measure more crime there, and then you enforce uh, your beliefs about where there are crime, because in places where police is not there, not all crime is reported. So you will reinforce the bias. There are more unethical cases like this uh, tool being used in, in Spain, where uh, basically it's like a lie detector for victims. So basically, are you saying the truth that someone stole your wallet or not? Uh, and here is already an ethical issue because you are applying this to the victims, not to possible offenders. And this happens also in, in Germany, but immediately a, a, a party uh, went to court to uh, challenge this. And, and certainly we have to see what happens because this recent discovery what is the result of that, of that challenge. Now, let me give you a very interesting example, one of the best examples I've seen of, of a very detailed analysis on uh, basically discrimination in justice. So this is a problem of uh, giving bails to, to people in the state of New York. So you have an offender and the, and the well, possible offender and the judge has to decide if you get bail or not. In most places in the world, we need to think if the person will reoffend and if he will appear in court. In New York, the judge has to decide only based on if we will appear in court, which is already difficult if you have, a, say, a serial killer. Well, if you get bail and pay, you get out. If you get bail and cannot pay, there's always a, a, a person in the US that lends money to, to people to, to, to be bailed. And um, this person has to do the same prediction of the judge, right? One problem in this kind of settings is that we do not know part of the picture. So we don't know, know what will happen if a person that didn't get bail we have that bail, and for example, if the person would have reoffended or uh, not appear in court. So for this, we need to do data imputation, which is something that, that complicates this problem. And then you need to have part of the data only to impute uh, and predict possible uh, outcomes in the system. So what were the results of this paper by Kemberg et al., so very famous researchers here, uh, in a work that was requested by the National Bureau of Economic Research of the US, not by the National Bureau of Justice. Uh, they want to spend this money in, in, in prison. And they thought that they could decrease the crime rate in 25% keeping the same jail rate, or they could, could decrease the prison rate in 42% keeping the same crime rate. And if their predictions are correct, remember these are predictions from the system, half of the most dangerous criminals uh, were uh, free and they reoffended or didn't appear in court more than half of the time. So, this is how they did the, the, the data in different sets. I think I will skip this. We don't have much time, but uh, they use gradient boost decision trees, which are non linear decision trees and allow some interpretability. They didn't have enough data to do, say, deep learning, only less than a million cases. And the only demographic variable was the age of the person. Not even the gender, because most of them are men, so the gender would not have done much. But there is no really variable where you can, for example, deduce the race of the person, like address or name. Well, what were the results? I already mentioned the results, but if you see uh, the distributions of defendants, most of them are from black or Hispanic origin. So you have 82%. And here I put the percentage in practice in the population. So already you have a bias uh, on the people that reach the court. Now the judges increase that bias. Basically they, they increase the percentage of black people. They decrease the percentage of Hispanic people maybe because they're more white there. Uh, but still the minority population goes up to 89%. What happened with the algorithm, with the model? Well, the algorithm learned to be racist, even more racist than the judges. So 
the percentage of black people went from 57 to 60%. Decreases also the same uh, for the Spanish population, but in total, 90% of the people were of these two minorities. However, because it, it's an algorithm, we can uh, tune the algorithm to match, for example, the less racist judge, and there, still there, you can get an improvement of 23% on the crime rate. So what is happening? Well, this picture shows very well what is happening. Assume the predictions of the system are correct. If you want to send additional people to prison, you see the algorithm will take the top candidates, so the ones that are more dangerous. However, if you see what is what judges will do, and judges were divided in five groups to do the data imputation, so I don't have time to, to, to explain that. But basically, uh, they use soft judges to predict hard judges. You see that, that they are basically sending people to prison or, or, or free in a random way. So it's not really uh, similar to that. So here we have a dilemma. The dilemma is what do we refer? A bias algorithm that in some sense is just because for the same data gives the same answer, or we want to have a noisy judge because the judge doesn't decide all the time the same. Now, not all, mis all judge decisions may be a mistake. For example, sometimes you need to free a person even if you don't want to free it because the law says that. So here the context is missing and no algorithm will have the context of the judge. So this is the problem because justice is something human. Uh, the, the, the algorithm doesn't know things that we, we know. So it's very hard to say what is right and wrong here. I was using a very interesting article from Daniel Kahneman and co-authors uh, that was published in 2016 in Harvard Business Review, but recently uh, Daniel Kahneman and uh, two colleagues uh, published a book last May called Noise, a Flaw in Human Judgment. And the difference between uh, machines and people. At least machines don't have so this is an advantage. On the other hand, they don't understand the context and, and have other limitations that I will mention uh, later. So there are many examples of this discrimination. For example, I, I would say the one that you see more in the news uh, have to do with facial recognition. This was very clear in 2019. Then was very clear with the documentary uh, that I just mentioned, coded bias in last year. And at the end, uh, basically, uh, there is also an ethical component here, because if you check uh, from where the images came to develop facial recognition, most of the, them came from the web in the last, say, 14 years. Of course, these pictures had no consent. So all, all the technology also basically was developed without the consent of people, uh, people's uh, faces. So because of all this, uh, in June last year, Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM decided to stop selling rec uh, facial recognition to, to police. Uh, for example, IBM had a very good reaction to this documentary. Uh, Amazon had a bad reaction to this documentary, basically uh, saying that they were doing well. Also, the ACM uh, Technology Policy Committee uh, did uh, the same statement. I participated in the statement of a part of the committee in June 30 last year. But then it was too late. Why? Because the system were already being used. And in, in September, another person was uh, falsely accused, black person, of a crime because of the system. There are other problems like gender bias. And, and this is an example that is not, doesn't work any longer, but just very well the problem. So I write this a babysitter. She's a doctor. I translated to Turkish. I don't know any Turkish, so I cut and paste. And I translated back to English. And, says she's a babysitter, he's a doctor. Well, now they have fixed it, both are female. So, uh, so I guess this is a affirmative action. They're doing positive bias. However, if you put many, many sentences, it doesn't work. So for two sentences working, for one sentence, they, they will give you the two genders. And there we have a problem with that, that gender is, we know it's not binary, and then it's more complicated. 
But this happens also in a stereotype. So this is a very, very famous paper on New Lips 2016, where if she's a nurse, then she's a, he's a surgeon. Or if he's a superstar, she's a diva. We know that there's some negative connotations to diva. So after seeing this, I, I, I basically did some, some research to say, okay, most journalists in the USA should be men. And this is true, but I found out that uh, most students in the US are, are female. So there is a basically there's a racism, sorry, there's a gender bias only to get the job. Another stereotypes, uh, for example, this is a paper from Stanford, and you can see uh, here that uh, Hispanic, you are the driver, but if you're white, you are the sheriff or the administrator. So clearly also this uh, is tied to, to ethnic origins. And then even religion. So here are uh, the size of language models. So language models are very large word embeddings being used to generate text. And here you can see that uh, the largest model known from uh, Google has 1.6 trillion parameters. This is uh, comparable to the size of words in the web. And for example, a recent paper showed that this anti-Muslim bias. So basically, if you write two Muslims walk into, and then you ask GPT-3 to complete this sentence, most completions will be violent. In fact, will be four times more violent for Muslims than for Christians. And I guess the good news is that for Buddhists and atheists, we are the most uh, uh, pacific people, at least in the news in the world. But can be much more complicated. So for example, last year when the UK decided to predict the score to enter the university, they uh, discriminated uh, poor people. Or more interesting, when January this year, uh, the Libido was accused of uh, discriminating riders, either like Lobo or Rappi, uh, they found out, out that the system itself learned to discriminate people that couldn't deliver food at night. And the judge said that in direct discrimination, because the algorithm was not checking why these people couldn't deliver at night, like having uh, having dependents or, or in the last case, not wanted to work at all times. And other cases, for example, uh, last end of last year, six drivers uh, sue uh, Uber in, in uh, Netherlands. These drivers were in the UK and Portugal because they were uh, basically fired because an algorithm said that they were cheating. And at the end, they won the case because Uber decided not to present in the court. Maybe because they didn't want to share the code, but basically they didn't defend themselves. And the worst example, the last one, is maybe what happened in Netherlands early this year too. The whole government had to resign. What happened during many years in the past decade, uh, there were being several arguments were being used to discriminate people, for example, in child benefits, and trying to find the uh, fraud there, that affected 26,000 that were accused of, uh, of uh, fraud, and they had to return a lot of money. Some people lost their jobs, their houses, so they had to go back to their uh, countries of origin, and this, of, of course, affected poor people and immigrants. Was not enough that that uh, the former minister resigned; she was part of the parliament. The whole government had to resign. And this is just a sample of cases. There are hundreds of cases of discrimination of the thousands that you can find in this place, incident database. Let's go to the second problem. The second problem is uh, physiognomy. Uh, I don't know if you, when you study philosophy at, uh, at school, you learn that there are different kinds of people depending on the shapes of their, their face. And we know that's not true any longer. But some people is using AI to do this. For example, uh, Kosinski at Stanford use uh, spatial biometrics to predict sexual orientation. Of course, uh, the people are not happy. Before, some people in China uh, were using uh, your face to, to predict if you will be a criminal. So uh, again, uh, minority report. And last year happened again in the US in a spite that there was a lot of controversy a few years earlier. And this year, Kosinski came back and he said that using facial biometrics, he can predict your political orientation with 70% accuracy. 
was 70 percent accuracy is very easy to achieve with uh, basically uh, spurious correlations. Maybe the the the, the hair, the the clothing, even if you use some uh, in your face and so on. And this is kind of a modern phrenology. So phrenology was something that, that started end of the 18th century and was very popular in the 19th century. For example, one of the main uh, uh, people behind this were Dr. Cesare Lombroso in Torino, Italy, that collected hundreds of skulls because he believed uh, criminals had a different skull. And he was really consistent with his belief because he also left his skeleton uh, for posterity. I guess that he, this, that this is for him the ground truth of a good person, the good person that collected uh, bodies from the morgue that nobody wanted, so only collected poor people. And you can visit his, his house in Torino, uh, and it's very interesting. Although it's sad that the person did this. But can be worse. In uh, 2019, MIT, they published a paper in CVPR, a very, very well known conference, that thinks that given a piece of audio of your voice, they can basically predict your face. So I have my master phrenology algorithm that with your, you send me a piece of voice through WhatsApp, I will predict your face, and then I will use your face to predict your name. Yes, there's a proposal for a pattern from Mitre that says that they can predict your name from your face. I don't know what they do with all the adopted children from different cultures. And then I can know if you are opposed politically or homosexual or criminal. Not only this doesn't work scientifically, there's no causality, but also this is not ethical. So there are two problems here, and you see these problems in major universities. So then the IRBs are not working, and basically there are no real ethics uh, uh, board to check this thing, not even in the journals, in the conference. And this can be even more subtle. So a lot of people is using facial biometrics to recognize emotions, and this uh, work from a famous neuroscientist from our system, Lisa Feldman Barrett. She has great TED talks on emotions. Uh, basically, it shows that people cannot predict emotions. So, if people are labeling data and they cannot predict emotions, of course, AI cannot do it either. We are just rediscovering the stereotypes that work part of the time, not all the time. And please don't try to use your face for anything related to personality or emotions. Fourth problem, and fairly common. And this is important because we are all here. This is not something that affects only women or minorities. This affects anyone. So for example, uh, I know many people in, in the crowd, like my, my dear friend, Ricardo de Hav, uh, I can offer him something that I know he likes, but it's very hard to offer him something he doesn't know that if he knew it, he would like it. That's a filter bubble problem. And some people want to get out of the bubble, like Truman in the Truman Show, but many people is very happy on, on their false news bubble, and, and we have seen that in, in all uh, elections. Sadly, I saw it a few days, days ago in Chile. And systems are using things like diversity, novelty, serendipity to break this, this uh, personalization uh, bubble. But it's even worse, because if you're exposed to three recommendations of thousands is not like seeing the top of the iceberg. It's basically seeing the ice cube on the top of the iceberg. You are seeing three of thousands. And then the system itself is in a bubble. And this is the problem I'm, I'm, I'm doing research today because this not only generates a, a popularity bias, but also uh, creates uh, unfair markets that in the long run are very unhealthy and very unstable and also discriminate people in the long tail. So basically we have what is called the mass effect the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We are only increasing in the inequality that already is uh, going very fast in the world. Fourth problem, stupid models. In 1979, George Watts said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, he was talking about the statistics. We can say the same for, for mature learning. Let me give you some examples. In January, when uh, Elon Musk said, you Signal, and he was talking about chat app, uh, some software that used Twitter data from influential people started to buy 
as uh, a stock from this company in Texas, Signal Advance, and the price of the company went up 400%. So a lot of people lost money, um, except this company, but of course, there was no semantic understanding of what Elon Musk was, say, was saying. Or even worse, here you see on the right, uh, and it's a typical example of another AI, where if you change one pixel, you see the white pixel, so you change that, that pixel, and a horse becomes a dog or a car becomes an airplane. Or even worse, this could be, will sound funny, uh, some engineer in Facebook decided to use uh, an English train system for, for uh, basically uh, bad words and took away the page of the town of Bitche in France. And this town was three weeks without that page because there was no human in the loop to see the complaints. And this is not funny if they're using, for example, this uh, page for informing about. So even things that look funny may harm people. So we need to understand the limitations of technology. And I think that some many computer scientists believe that, that they can do anything and they can achieve uh, general intelligence when uh, that's not true. For example, the first thing is that to abstract, you need to forget, filter what you learn. Here, I, I like to remind the, the amazing uh, uh, short story from Borges, Funes de Memorius, that basically was a person that couldn't forget anything. And if you find him in the street and you say, what happened in the last hour, you will need to wait one hour. So he tells you exactly what happened in the last hour because he cannot forget anything. He can summarize. He cannot abstract. Very important, another important limitation, you cannot learn for some data. Sadly, this is what happened in, uh, in Arizona when a uh, self driving car killed a woman because in the data, there was no person crossing at night in a bicycle in a place where you should cross. And suddenly the person that was inside the car was looking at the cell phone, so couldn't uh, act uh, on time. Accuracy is not the key, it's the impact of error. I don't care if you, are, you work 99% of the time well, I care about what you do in that 1% of the errors. So uh, I'm working on this. On, on how to really evaluate based on harm and not based on success. And remember, for all the computer scientists here, be humble. An intelligent person when doesn't know says doesn't know. Especially if you're a teacher, you have to say, I don't know. Today, I'm seeing many classifiers that even if you have confidence uh, 0.5 or 2, they say something. Don't say something that you're not sure is true. And the last one is the waste of resources. So related to green computing. Again, I get back to, to this table of the language models where it, they show that, for example, to train a transformer architecture, uh, you need basically 57 years of the carbon print of a person, a standard person in the world. Or even worse, you need to spend one to $3 million in resources for this. So not all people can generate this, these models. And this is, this is a part of the content of this very famous paper now. Uh, maybe some people know it's here, the Stokasi Sparrow paper that meant that uh, Timothy Gabriel was fired from, from Google. She was the co-leader of the AI ethics team. And that implied that Margaret Mitchell couldn't put her name, the other leader, in the paper because Google forbid that. Uh, uh, but you can see her name. But that didn't matter because uh, she was also fired using an ethical argument uh, because of she was checking her email, but it's forbidden to check any email, including yours. Uh, but this is not new. For example, in uh, 2019, when Google tried to do an ethics board, had to dissolve it in one week because they chose people not too ethical. So this is the meta ethics problem of the industry. And this is not only true for Google, but also true for Facebook, Amazon, and so on. So this leads to the second part. The second part has to do with generic issues. The first one is properties a software that is transparent and accountable should fulfill. Here are the seven properties that uh, the ACM proposed in 2017. Uh, most software don't have these properties with awareness. 
And we need to remember that systems do not need to be perfect, but seems that they need to be much better than us. Why? Because people is much harder judging machines than judging people. So to where is human, but not for a computer, although they are learning from us. And you can check this in, in the recent book by uh, my fellow Chilean Cesar Hidalgo on how humans judge machines. I believe that uh, you can still get a digital version for free on, on her, this website. So there are pragmatical questions here. So which properties we need to fulfill in, in, in software that, that will be responsible? And, and there are many questions that I will not answer because there are no clear answers and also because this would take another talk. So I'm working on a paper that basically I check 30 different parts of software and I classify them to which part of the system applies and to whom they are important. And based on this, I have my own classification, my own taxonomy of these properties that are divided in six groups. Awareness, data provenance, completeness, usability, transparency, and responsibility. And you see here that the ACM ones are, are, are underlined. Uh, and of course, there are many more that are important. There are people already working on, on, on this kind of software like Ben Schneiderman. We have a group of people interested in this uh, in, in, in a very interesting mailing list that he, he has. And he uses the word trustworthy. I, I prefer not to use trustworthy because I believe we cannot trust this software. We know that we'll make mistakes. I prefer to, to, to use responsible AI because uh, we know that they will fail. So we need to make sure that we'll be accountable of those mistakes. So the next few be how we can develop software that is responsible with the help of AI. So AI helping to solve the problems of AI. Regarding culture, there are difference between Christians, Muslims, but I want to point out only one interesting uh, view from the south of Africa, Ubuntu. Ubuntu basically says that I am because we are. So that that is not the person who is important, it's the group which is important. And if you have read about the Dunbar number and, and that we originally were archives about 150 people, basically we are social species. We don't live uh, alone like a say a polar bear. So there's a very interesting uh, a say by Abeba Bilhani that said that the sculptures was wrong because a person is a person through other people. And then we have issues on identity, data protection, and privacy. They are, these are not the same thing, so I can be completely anonymous, but maybe I will be able to share part of my data. There are also legal issues like freedom of expression when I can do everything that's not forbidden against uh, data protection rights where I can do only what is allowed, and Brazil basically took GDPR uh, as a base for the uh, your new law of uh, data protection. Here we have issues like minimal data collection that is not fulfilled or minimal time storage and also not fulfilled for many apps and, and many other applications. If you're interested in the topic, uh, I recommend Privacy Power that is translated to Spanish and Portuguese uh, by Carissa Bellis. So in the article 72 of GDPR, just read the last line, says that a person can contest the decision. What that means for us, for computer scientists? That means that if you want to give individuals information about the processing, then you need to have interpretability. If you want to explain a decision to a given person because of a particular data, you need to have explainability, completely different. And if you want to make sure that the system is working all the time as intended, then you need to do continuous validation, testing, and maintenance. However, in some uh, applications, this may be a problem. For example, in health, having the wrong explanation may be worse than no explanation at all. So we need to make sure that the explanations are really very, very good. GDPR already has been used, this article 22, for AI, for example, in 2019, some French school to put a video surveillance for security, and then some parents took that to court, and the court in 2020 decided that that, that was illegal for three reasons. One, they didn't have the competence, so for example, they couldn't decide to put cameras. 
this is something that sometimes we don't think about it. Do you have the, the power to make the decision to use something? Then they didn't have consent. Uh, basically, uh, you cannot consent to a camera. And, and of course, this in this case, there's no legal basis, which is the other possibility for, for using a camera. And finally, proportionality, very, very important. The solution was not proportional to the problem being solved. You, can, you don't need to video everything to have security in the school. So what about regulation? Well, regulation is complicated. We are seeing regulation in the, in, in the EU. We talk about this in the US. However, I believe we shouldn't regulate technology. We should regulate the problem, the use of technology, and any technology, not AI. Otherwise, I see in the future regulation for blockchain, regulation for quantum computing, regulation for every new technology or invent. We cannot do that. We need to do like human rights. We need to write general regulation that applies to a given sector like we already do with drugs, with food, or with education. Today, there are three different cases in, in, uh, in the US against the three major companies, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And I, I guess they will develop this, this year. Uh, there were several proposals to be made in the US during the Trump government, and all of them were rejected, even one that was proposed, proposed by Kamala Harris. And I guess something will happen. Uh, Trump, before leaving, created the National AI Office. Um, he took two years to do it, but before he left it, so I can interpret that. And I hope there will be a lot of uh, changes in the Biden administration, in particular, Khan was uh, named in in antitrust, and she was uh, criticizing a lot uh, antitrust in e-commerce. Last April, uh, appeared the draft for the proposed regulation on AI. Uh, the first problem I already said it is, is regulating the use of the technology instead of regulating the problem. However, there's another bigger problem for me. It takes a risk uh, approach, basically divide the world in, in four types of risk, forbidden, High risk, low risk, and no risk. Well, risk is a continuous variable. So basically, I imagine the game that companies will do trying to be in the lowest uh, risk uh, possible. So this will be a problem to basically to enforce and to do the self-assessment that uh, you are supposed to do according to this proposal. One article is very interesting, Article 5, that says that you are forbidden to use Similar techniques to distort a person's behavior that may cause physical or psychological harm. So if you apply this to the semantics of the word, means that I cannot offer a cake to a diabetic person as an ad in, in the web, because that will harm not only psychological, but also physical. That would, could imply that, that the usage of devices should be limited in time or the use, use of video games to be limited on time because we are basically doing psychological harm in, in many cases, it's an addiction. So this will be very hard to, to apply and very important, uh, although maybe good for humanity because otherwise we'll be connected all the time to the internet. So something interesting here because of this uh, risk uh, approach and it's the same that happened with race example, a skin color is another continuous variable. We, as humans, always try to, to, to put things in, in categories, in, in buckets. And this um, may be a very dangerous cognitive bias that we have. If you have a continuous variable, please don't create categories. Don't try to, to discretize the world for anything that's discrete. For uh, some cities are doing the registered algorithms, like for transparency, like Amsterdam and Helsinki, making algorithms public. Maybe they can be gained, but this is an approach. A lot of people are doing auditing algorithms, in most cases, against the will of the companies being audited. Uh, for example, uh, typical in big internet companies. But last March, the first paper appeared that basically does a full audit with the cooperation of a company, this was a com company doing hiring uh, uh, people, and it's where you can see it, it's very interesting, and this is from North System, that's one of the best auditing algorithms uh, teams in the world. We have a lot of bad human practice in our profession, I will not this uh, to, to, to save time, 
but I'm sure you know uh, all of them. These are typical things that they start with, uh, I guess, a trial and error uh, way to do things. Uh, imagine if uh, construction were done by trial and error, like we do things. Some professional biases, we are with the hype of big data, when most companies in the world will never have big data, we need to focus on small data. And, and if you're interested in that, I wrote an essay in KD Nuggets in 2018 about small data. What about the coders, the designers? Can their bias be transferred to the code? Well, I've seen in my, in my bias talk that's available in YouTube, a data science paper of University of Virginia, but lately in Norway, they show that the bias of the coders is transferred to the code. So possibly uh, software that is done by women will be more empathic than software done by men. And this is something that no one has tried yet. And in evaluation, well, uh, for people that review papers in conference, we see things like this all the time. They don't choose the right experiment. They don't choose the right test data. They don't choose the right metrics. They don't choose the right baseline. And this is a great talk uh, of Julio Gonzalo about this. So what we can do to finish? We can analyze for unknown unknown biases. It's not easy, but we can try to mitigate the problem with data. If that's the case, we need to make the model aware of bias and we need to make the user aware of bias. So we need to inform the user about all possible things that are basically potentially modificating their behavior. And finally, in evaluation and deployment, we shouldn't fool ourselves. We should be very tough with our software, do all the tests that you need, do the most tough comparison, and probably the result will be that we are not improving anything, but that's the truth. So recommendations for us, uh, remember the limitations I mentioned. Please remember these limitations. Say, I don't know when you don't know. Uh, try to have a code of ethics. Try to have humans in control and not humans in the loop. We are playing God, so let's be accountable and be responsible on that. And remember that ethics is, is a bit like privacy. It doesn't depend only on your ethics. It depends on the ethics of your providers and also the ethics of your clients. Ethics is a network, like privacy is a network. And we need to be careful. So um, the final messages, remember everything is a reflection sometimes amplified of our world. There's no virtual world, it's the same world through the different mirror. We need to be aware of our own biases and ethics to, to start solving these problems. And then remember ethics is complicated, like Kaiser Henderson says, can AI, AI algorithms ever be ethical? As I said, no, because they're not human. But even if we believe they can be human, uh, this will be an issue, especially and someone has to say it, because we cannot have AI ethics without ethics. So start with the ethics and then worry about AI ethics. Otherwise, we'll get uh, problems. So my main worry is not artificial intelligence, it's natural aliens. I see that in every election, sadly. And otherwise, we will have this kind of uh, uh, black joke that says, prove you're not a human. The robot says there are no more humans and they both laugh. Not because they kill the humans, because uh, we kill ourselves, as Harari will say. So we need to be careful about what we are doing and, and, and not make ethics to run behind technology as usual, but think about the risks and about the possible harms before that. So with that, I can take uh, questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Ricardo. Excellent, awesome talk. And I will just try to summarize in a few words here, the take home lesson as you put, humans in control, humans in the loop, AI solutions to extend ourselves and not to uh, replace ourselves or our authority or decision-making, awesome. So uh, I have a few questions here. Uh, some from myself and uh, some from the audience. Uh, I will start with the audience here. Uh, the first question that I have is uh, from uh, Professor Marcos Endler, our partner in this uh, Conexão Rio Campinas. He is uh, here with us. Uh, Marcos, would you like to read your own question? And please go ahead. 
Ja, okay. Uh, 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 so good, uh, good evening. Uh, so thank you very much uh, again, uh, Ricardo. It, it, it was an honor for us to, to have you uh, talking here for, for us on a, such an important uh, topic. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure, actually. Uh, my, 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 um, my, my question is actually, if the, these, uh, the problems that you stated, uh, many of those, uh, of, of the, the bias and the, the lack of privacy and so on, isn't it is a natural consequence that the, we are developing so many systems so fast, looking always on the profits and on uh, <clears throat> shipping the, 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 the products on some uh, very uh, tight schedules and don't uh, having time to think about the, the consequences of the use of, of the system or not so deeply, I mean, as, as it should. I mean, as I would say, isn't a, a real con, con, uh, consequence that we are developing, that we are so dependent now on software and AI and so on. Maybe uh, uh, 50 years ago, we were not so much dependent. So maybe the uh, developers could also yeah, have more time to, to think if their program was running the right uh, uh, numerical uh, calculations in order to get the, the right uh, predictions. And now we have to predict all things uh, together. And maybe this is the, 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 the problem. And so the engineers don't catch up with this problem. Could you comment on this, maybe? Yeah, very, very good question. So the, the first thing I will say that something that something that sometimes we forget is that we start if we start using the technology too much, the number of problems will grow the same way. So if something grows exponentially, the number of mistakes also will grow exponentially. This is just a, a law of mathematics. Just, even if it's a small percentage. So this is why we are seeing already thousands of problems reported. I imagine that the, the real number is more, but we don't know it. Like uh, because another we have another bias is that we like to talk about our success, but we don't like to talk about our failures. And you know that we are more <laughs> failures. We have more failures than successes. Imagine if we have a book of all the startups that fail. Maybe we have much more successful startups because we will say, okay, no, don't do this. So this is the first thing. The second thing is that, that I agree, like, for example, engineers should learn more about uh, ethics and technology. Um, at least to learn about what are the questions that they need to ask. I recently wrote an article in Forest Technology Forum about the 10 questions that companies should uh, ask themselves before using AI. And suddenly many of these questions are never asked. So sometimes I think awareness will solve like 90% of the problem. Awareness of the questions that you need to ask, awareness of the bias that you need to check and so on. But sometimes I see even people that really know about the field using everything as a black box. And, and, and you know, black boxes are, are, are not the best way. So if you're a real engineer, a real engineer needs to understand the black box. Sure. We cannot use things like, okay, it works, it's magic. Because if it's magic for some of us, for other people, it's really real magic, right? You for other people, it's black magic. So, uh, we we need to to basically change the the way we think about things and and as you said and sadly ethics I always say ethics is always running behind technology and only we will catch up technology when something won't happen like a, a woman dies in Arizona but then then they do a stop and then they continue running and ethics keep running behind so the problem where we need to stop and think and uh, and the same is happening not only with this technology this is not new it happened with pollution and when we have climate change problems now. It happened with radioactivity. It happened with atomic bombs. The only case where I think we acted before seeing the problem was uh, chemical warfare. We decided not to use chemical weapons in advance. Yes. Because I think that's the only example. We need to do more of the same. Basically say, stop, let's see what we want to, for our world and, 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 and do it better. Very good. Okay, thank thank you. Uh, Ricardo, I was uh, attending a, a meeting uh, yesterday, and uh, we had present uh, Judah Pearl and Yosha Banjo, and they were discussing that 
one big problem in this uh, biased solutions is that there is no common sense uh, in the algorithms and uh, there is no analysis of causality. So do you think that one possible way uh, of uh, attacking the biased uh, the bias in the data and the bias in the algorithm is uh, tying up some mechanisms to analyze causality and try to understand some common sense? Yes, by all means, causality is something that we, we, we are missing because uh, we are using too many correlations, like for example, all these phenology examples are just correlations and, and most probably it's fully correlation. So, Causality, I think, will be something very important to, to do more. But also, with that, I think we need to do more semantics by basically adding knowledge. Sometimes we are rediscovering things that we already know. For example, in, in, in natural language processing, we are rediscovering things we already know, like grammar and other things that, that, that if you try to put it in the system, you at least are adding the knowledge we already, we already have. And, and and the third thing I think I mentioned it too, but I think it's very important is how to increase knowledge of the content of the of the, the operation of the system because data is not everything. Data is just what is uh, most visible on the problem. But for example, what about the context? Uh, a judge, yes. Judging has a big context. Uh, for example, the same judge and to, the, and, the, and to the same situation, if the political situation in a country changes, may have to decide something different. Also, if the law changes. So sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes, for example, the data doesn't include the changes in the law and that can change the decision. So we have all these things that we try, we believe that, that we can do more than we can because we are not taking into account, as you said, causality, uh, context and schematics. I would say these are the three main things that we need to, to add to, to this. And I would think that we, it's not human intelligence. We are creating a different type of intelligence. This yes. is intelligence yes. where the skills are they, are, they are faster, they have better memory, they, they can do brute force because of that, and we cannot. They, they don't have some limitation that we have. But on the other hand, we don't, they cannot think like us, and for example, they use much more energy than us. So yes. the brain is amazing yes. so in, in, in the efficiency of energy. Very good, thank you. I have a question now uh, from Maria Eduarda. Uh, she is asking if do you see or do you envision that at some point in the future we are going to be able to develop algorithms that don't have bias? Uh, my personal opinion is that probably not, but I would like to to hear your opinion on that. Get rid of bias. This is something uh, first because of human. Second, because we, there are some biases that we don't know. We are not aware until they appear, until, until there's a problem. But I believe we can mitigate them. And the first way to mitigate them is to be, make people aware of them. So, so for example, um, for me, it was natural to say men instead of saying humans, because we, I was trained like, like that. But yes, I trained myself yes. to detect my own biases, and now I say human beings, uh, people, and, and not men to say humans. And and. This thing happens all the time. It's encoded in the language. For example, how do you say accountability in Portuguese? Well, there is no word for that. Uh, we have well, some some that's candidates. My <laughs> that's my point. We don't want to be accountable in Spanish or Portuguese, so we don't have a word for that. That that's not by chance. So there, so the the language also encodes a lot of things that 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 shapes us culturally. So I'm sure you have to say something like "rendizado de contas" or. Or like in Spanish, but but a lot of things are coding the language. So awareness, I would say, solves ninety percent of the problem. So if the designer is aware, if the coder is aware, if the user is aware, if the system is aware, we are already doing a lot of things. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, now I have a question from our colleague from Chile, uh, Professor Domingo Mary. Uh, who I also oh, thank for, for accepting to be one of our uh, speakers uh, early in 2022. So Domingo is uh, thanking you for the great talk and he is uh, saying that you, you mentioned some uh, efforts in the European Union and uh, North America for regulation. Are you aware of any regulation in Latin America in general? 
So, so I think there's no, no regulation yet in Latin America. So what we have is many strategies in AI that, that, that include uh, as part of the strategy that they will need to regulate. So we already have, I would say Colombia is one of the best. We have to also have Brazil, we also have Chile. Uh, we have uh, more on digital government in Uruguay. We have also draft in Peru. Uh, I know Costa Rica is working on one. Mexico did a multi-actor multi approach that is very, very interesting because you have a national consensus that doesn't come from the government and then the government doesn't use it. Uh, Argentina did one, the previous government, and put it in a, in a, in a desk because oh. the, new government, the new government didn't like it. So we have our, our own problems on, on these strategies, but I believe that, that the, the most important thing here will be to, to, to have coordination. Some, some, something that didn't happen for COVID and we should have, the same should be true in AI because if regulations are different, I see where companies will go. Companies will go, the startup will go to the less regulated place to do things. So, so, so we need more coordination also at the, at the world level. Very good. Um, another question now from Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel is mentioning that uh, we also have the challenges regarding like uh, data that are synthetically generated. So how do you see these problems of biases when you put in the game something like generative adversarial networks? So it seems to complicate things way more because uh, you need to differentiate what's real data, what's synthetic data, if the synthetic data is biased by itself or is trying to mitigate the bias or increase the bias. So how do you see this? Yeah, it's a very good question. I don't think I have the, the, a, a clear answer to that. I, I'm not an expert on guns, but, but, but if we can generate synthetic data that's not biased, that would be amazing. But yeah. the question is, if we know to do that, why we need artificial intelligence? Yes. So, so <laughs> <laughs> and we have a paradox. If, if we already know what is the right data, so maybe we just know how to solve it. And, and the truth is that in many cases, we don't agree. So for example, instead of having bias, uh, like neutral data, data, I would say many times you have data that has multi view point of view. For example, uh, if you want to discuss things like uh, complicated, like abortion or, or uh, euthanasia or other things, you don't have a, uh, one answer. You have multiple answers. And yes. then you need to take in account the, these different, for example, religious differences, cultural differences. And then I would prefer uh, uh, something more smart that says, look, I cannot answer you, but I know that there are six different views. Uh, and these are the arguments. You have to choose is the best answer for you. Because otherwise, if we have a single answer, we are biasing people to, to the dominant view, and we know that the dominant view is not always the right answer. Like, uh, for example, if we go back 500 years, uh, slavery was okay. If we go back 100 years, uh, women no vote, not voting was okay, and so on. So if we want to change the future, I think we need to don't use data from the past. That's and very that means maybe we shouldn't use AI. We should think everything from scratch. Which goes in the direction of not trying to ingest all the data that's out there and try to develop algorithms that are robust to be trained with small data. This is very important. Very good point. And yeah, I this think is small data also is much more difficult because you need to, to be sure that how good is your, your, your prediction. Another yeah. problem that, that, that is, is in the way we evaluate things is that we are using accuracy, which is an average of success. Yes. So we are not checking what is the harm, the harm of failure, but also if you, if you give me 90% accuracy, I'm sure that basically that means that you have 100% accuracy for the easy problems and 60% accuracy for the difficult problems. <laughs> for the easy problems, it's easy. For the difficult ones are the ones. So I, I please try to check, focus on, on the problems that are really difficult. I don't care about the average. Average is very bad number to measure. We need to know the distribution. We need to know the variance. We need to know error analysis. How many papers do error analysis? Very few. Yes. And this goes with your lesson also here. Uh, accuracy is not the key. Uh, yeah. Impact is the key. Impact of the errors. Very good. Yeah. I have a question now from Marcelo. Uh, thanks for the presentation. What is your view on opaque 
versus transparent models and proposals such as having public policies forcing companies to prove transparency, uh, transparent models cannot perform as well as opaque ones before employing opaque models. It's like some companies claim that if they need to explain the answer, the, 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 the algorithm itself will be worse. And how, how do you see this dichotomy? Uh, that's the fallacy. Uh, and I agree. Not always true. This is not always, there's a myth, and there's a very interesting paper by Cynthia Rudin that shows that that's not true. In fact, in some competitions, uh, interpretable models have won over deep learning. So this, this depends on the problem, depends on the data, depends on the many factors. So, so it's a myth that to have more interpretability, explainability, you, you lose accuracy. Uh, but even if we lose accuracy, I don't care because accuracy is not the key, right? <laughs> so, so this is the other part of my answer. I also remember many times we are deciding things that we should leave to the domain expert on the problem to decide. For example, whenever you are using accuracy to decide the operation point of your of your algorithm, you're already deciding something that maybe is incorrect. For example, if you are predicting an illness, uh, what I care is about the right ratio between false positive and false negative. And if you ask a doctor, the doctor will tell you that they're willing to see 10 people that is not ill to basically do not miss any people that is ill. So, so and that is a different operation point that will not be a, on, on, on the default values of the black box you are using. And that means that you need to basically put it in a different thing. And I, and I don't mind the accuracy that you get there. What I want is that the doctor is happy that you see a lot of people and making a lot of people happy and saying, you're not ill, don't worry, the, the machine made a mistake. Just to make sure that you don't, you don't miss a, a person with cancer. This is a very good point because uh, sometimes uh, students get mad or uh, unhappy because they submit a paper to CVPR, for instance, and the paper is not accepted because it was like 0.5% uh, lower than the competitor. But accuracy is not everything. So this is an important lesson that everyone should uh, take into account. I have a question now from Antonio. Um, and uh, I will complement that with a, a very good book that you mentioned in your talk, which is Noise uh, by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, it's an amazing book. And uh, in one of the situations discussed in the book, he says, uh, judges, um, when they judge in the morning, uh, they are more positive than when they judge in the afternoon just after lunch. So this is one. On that. Yes. That is so paper. this is one problem that uh, we have in terms of humans deciding. On the other side, we could have the algorithms to help, but we know that the algorithms also can be biased. So Pedro, Antonio Pedro is asking here, how can we convince authorities to adopt such systems that we know beforehand that might be biased? <laughs> that in this case we need to we need to use these systems as, as support not as, as decision makers we have a problem there because we have a cognitive bias to 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 basically tend to agree with with systems supporting us so basically if you get a recommendation you will be you have an anchor bias and, and also a confirmation bias to, to what system is is uh, recommending you but we need to have the, for you to say, human in the loop, but I prefer to say humans in control. So you need to have a, a, a judge that is in control of, of the result. And basically, even, even informing the system why it's not taking the same decision because of, for example, missing context, missing uh, a low argument, or whatever is missing, that even you can say, OK, this time I will be more lenient. and, and and because of uh, other human uh, reason, you change your, your ability. So I would say that, that we need it. So we always did this false dichotomy of uh, computers replacing humans. We need to work together. So yes, we, we are, definitely. We are different, we are complementary, and we should be working together. But we have people trying to force us to take a decision when, when the best decision is let's work together. Yep. You are good at this, I'm good at this, and, and, and let's try to let's try to do system that solves things that people don't want to, to do, not system that replace, uh, replace us, because yeah. I believe we are a re I, I totally agree with you, and this goes in, in line with uh, the humans 2.0, or 3.0, according to Max Tegmark in that uh, very good so, book. 
So Anderson, uh, I would love to, to keep talking, but I have a meeting in two minutes, so maybe- Yes, I, I would like to wrap this up. Uh, thanking you again for the very, very good talk. And I, 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 the chat is crazy. Uh, we never had like these many questions and comments and congratulations. So uh, Ricardo, if, thank if, you if very you much. Say, if you can save the chat and send it to me because we don't have that option, I would appreciate it because then I can check the, the questions. And I think yes. they have been very interesting. I, I will definitely yeah. save it and uh, send it to you. And uh, if you can share the, the slides later, it would be great. Yes, so, I will do that. I will send you the slides. All right. So in, in, in the name again of the Institute of Computing and also the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, we thank you very much for your time and the excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anderson, Marcus, and uh, muito obrigado to, to all my uh, Brazilian friends. That I, I many people uh, also speak Spanish, like Domingo, Mauricio, from I guess he's in, he's in Brasilia, and other people that, that, that I know. So thank you for coming. Obrigado. Thank okay. you. Obrigado. Muito obrigado a vocês. Bye. 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 Bye.